I've got a little thing here before I, I get into the weeds a little bit. I've only done this twice, including right now. Executive education here at Maxwell. Come closer, pretend like you like me. <laughs> I showered this morning. So uh, this is given out by alumni of the Canines for Warriors program for individuals and entities that have gone above and beyond to provide outstanding care and support for not only the service animal, but the handler as well. And being the first service animal, I'm told, team here at Maxwell Exec Ed, you guys are doing things above and beyond. So I'm gonna hand this to you since you. you're the one who said welcome thank to the school. So, much. so thank you. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another little tradition here in the military. Mm -hmm. This is how we show appreciation. Oh, thank you. For inviting me to come and speak. This is a coin on behalf of Canines for Warriors. Another thing that I've never handed out before. <laughs> so, oh, we're honored. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And I didn't introduce Molly, so I'll give yes. the honors to you. All right. So, well, I got a really great welcome here from, uh, from Martha. Uh, my name is Adam Legrand. I'm a retired Air Force Staff Sergeant E5. Um, I was a medic for about 10 years, and uh, just before my 10th anniversary, I was uh, medically retired due to spinal cord injuries. Uh, later on, discovered that my brain injury that I suffered while overseas was starting to have a cognitive impact on me as well. And being a medic, there are things that I'm not gonna tell you right now because you're having some delicious pizza, and I want you to enjoy it, but there are things that will cause me nightmares for the rest of my life. And having those post-traumatic stress night terrors, so it's not even like your normal nightmare, it's like your nightmare on steroids, if anybody's had one. Molly gets me through, through those. She works faster than any medication to get me calmed down, and I'm talking like injectable Halidol. She's faster. Uh, so that is why I applied to Canines for Warriors to help with my post-traumatic stress and some of the mobility issues that I'm having with traumatic brain injury. And if you notice, Molly's not a purebred. Canines for Warriors prides themselves on removing as many dogs from high-kill shelters and pairing them up with disabled vets like myself. So that's a little background on me and a little bit on Molly. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about some of the common myths, some of the current policy, some future policy, and efforts and opportunities that we have coming. Side. We'll go with plan B. All right. So some of the common myths to, to talk about, um, we do have some service animals here on campus, and some of you may be familiar with what really makes a service animal versus your working canines. You see them with TSA more than likely, or in your jobs within the federal government. You might have a patrol animal or a bomb detection animal outside, say, the Pentagon or other buildings. Service animals have to provide a minimum number of tasks specifically to the disabled individual's needs to improve their quality and activities of daily living. Therapy animals are nothing but pets that have an invitation to a particular place, such as a nursing home. Nursing homes are becoming more and more popular with having pets coming in as therapy animals and you even see them in courtrooms assisting you know, juveniles as they're testifying against their abusers. ESAs and pets, emotional support animals is just a quick overview. That's a letter from a medical provider saying that you deserve a pet and you want that pet to help you by comfort and comfort is the only task. So emotional support animals, sometimes they're housing protections in that varies between state to state. However, service animals are considered medical equipment, just like wheelchairs or any cane, crutch, or orthopedic aid. So no housing issues there, no transportation issues there. Everything is defined by the, assist <clears throat> the ADA 1990, uh, Accessibility Act. Uh, so what is a service animal? Kind of touched that already. A service animal has to provide a minimum number of tasks to mitigate the disabilities of the handler. You see seeing eye animals, 
Uh, sometimes you'll see deaf uh, assistance animals. You'll see uh, other animals that help pull people in a wheelchair. What Molly does specific to me is that she creates space around me. She forces me uh, to get out of situations. We've all seen a, an infant have that startle reflex. Sometimes if there's you know a car backfire or gunfire or other loud noise, I will lock up and she will physically remove me from that situation. I uh, talked a little bit about the nightmare mitigation, but most commonly that you'll see around campus is that when I'm going up and down stairs or through narrow hallways or when I'm already having some dizziness or vertigo, every one of her vests has a handle on it for me to be able to brace to get through that situation. And those are some of the reasons to also acquire a service animal. Service animal should be there for a disabled individual to improve their quality of life. It's not for people that want to slap uh, a vest that they bought on Amazon or internet certified their pet so that they can travel with their pet. That, that's not what this is about. And that actually negatively impacts us individuals that do have service animals. So some of the handler responsibilities, if Maxwell was to say, hey Adam, we're going to do a trip down to Gettysburg, because there's an annual staff ride that uh, Professor Moret does, all the professor would have to do is say, hey Adam, what can we do to help make this happen for you? And then whatever accommodations that I need, I, I voice one-on-one, -on -one, and then off we go. So it's my responsibility to inform a car service or a hotel or an airline before I go. And if I do these things ahead of time, it prevents any possibility of really having an issue at the gate and being turned away. So the Americans with Disabilities Act 1990, this is the bread and butter uh, when it comes to disabilities, not just with service animals and accessibilities, but they're really the ones that define what a service animal is and the accommodations and accessibility that folks with disabilities uh, need to have in place. Uh, the Air Carrier Access Act of 1986, this is how the airline industry and other transportation modes have to implement as well. The Fair Housing Act 1968 and all the amendments since, they solidify not only does a service animal have a right and certain responsibilities, such as uh, a landlord can't charge me a pet deposit, pet rent, a uh, cleaning fee, I should be responsible for cleaning anything that my dog does. So that's up to debate there from the handler's perspective. Uh, in the future, we are working on a lot of different things on Capitol Hill, and it's all kind of going on simultaneously. The PAWS Act, uh, HR 2732, I'm sorry, 2327, is currently making its way, and it's uh, currently in the House VA subcommittee, uh, chaired by uh, Congressman Rowe out of uh, Tennessee, and it's being held until the VA research is complete, and we should hopefully have that sometime within the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, Senator Burr from North Carolina recently made some news, especially after the service peacock incident that uh, Delta handled, and is working with the airlines and other organizations such as Canines for Warriors and the Association of Service Animal Providers for Military Veterans to make changes. So this way, only qualified service animals are, are clearly defined within the law, and this way it can be enforceable. The Association of Service Animal Providers for Military Veterans is an NGO, and it's a conglomerate, and for the better choice of words, it's a trade association. So there are currently 10 member organizations where Canines for Warriors is one of the founders, and it's how they get together and set national standards, and they're really the ones influencing and writing uh, some of this legislation to try to get it pushed through Congress to help not only the veteran community, but the general disabled community as a whole. Canines for Warriors is the leading service animal provider for military veterans, not only by pure numbers, we are close to 500 graduates, but we're saving many more dogs. And the, as I said earlier, the majority of the dogs come out of high kill shelters. So it's saving two lives and giving the new leash on life to both. So uh, 
There are two locations. One's in Point of Vedra, Florida. If anybody's familiar uh, with Florida, it's near uh, TPC Sawgrass if you're a golfer. We're about halfway between Jacksonville and St. Augustine. A wealthy family made a donation, and now there's a gold family campus, and today happens to be their second day with a warrior training class. So they're now going to be training a total of 16 teams every month. So this is, these are big numbers, and it's a proven quality program, especially because with the Research Institute, we're having a lot of data that's coming through with specifically with Purdue University and others. Uh, right now there are talks that even IVMF might be doing some research along with canines to solidify that the process is working and help with the VA legislation. Uh, TED Talks. Uh, there are a couple folks within canines, especially the founder, Sherry Duval, uh, has been on TEDx uh, at least once or twice, and there are even more of our alumni that have had the opportunity to go and talk about their experiences as well. So the current efforts and opportunities, research, research, research. The more research we have, the better. The Human Animal Behavioral Research Institute has been a very big supporter along with Merrick Dog Food. Uh, not only does Merrick sponsor some of the research, but they also provide every dog with every food they could possibly ever need while on campus. It comes in by two semi-trucks at a time. Uh, and it's always fun to watch those photos, especially if you follow on social media. <clears throat> People like me, there are several of us alumni that are ambassadors that speak at different events such as this. And I've got two more coming up that not only is it about some fundraising and sharing not only my personal stories, but also helping to destigmatize mental health and the need to go and get help. Sometimes the best medication isn't prescribed in pill form. Sometimes it comes with four legs. Um, <clears throat> So if I'm able to tell my story in, in detail within you know, the veteran community specifically, maybe I can get somebody to hop off the ledge or somebody, uh, I know we have an army chaplain here, not to call you out, sir, but if he was to reach out to some of his friends from you know, years ago or anybody else military or anybody here, call out and say, hey, how are you doing? I haven't heard from you in a while. Somebody might be able to get off the ledge because they've heard about this. And that, that's really what's important. There is a documentary that was filmed partially here on campus. And we are going to be having a screening with more details to come. Uh, the documentary is called A New Leash on Life, The Canines for Warriors Story. And it's being uh, presented in, on behalf of the Student Veterans Organization and the College of Visual and Performing Arts and the Disability Cultural Center. So I've got a couple web links and information. Um, I don't expect you to write this down. However, the bit.ly uh, web links, they are case sensitive, and I do have print materials here. Uh, all of my slides, I'm more than happy to email them to anybody. If anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to speak offline as well as the forum here. So does anybody have any questions? Shelters. Correct. How much time does it take to convert a raw dog to a service animal? A couple, a couple of things that uh, there's some great partners out there in the community that do the, the dog sourcing. And what they do is they look for a dog under the age of two because they want the service animal to be trained no older than the age of two and has a great life expectancy and, and working. But they also look for minimum requirements. Are they at least 24 inches to the top of the shoulders? And do they weigh at least 50 pounds? I'm not exactly a, the biggest guy in the room. However, you know, we have had alumni that have needed dogs in the size of the you know, giant breeds. So to answer your question, the training time really depends on the dog. Uh, Molly was pretty quick. I found out that she got out of quarantine in mid-September. She was... Uh, trained up and ready to go just before uh, December, so before Thanksgiving even, of 2015. And you know, we were paired up and we've been a team ever since. Are there, are there any limitations or preferences in terms of dog breeds? Uh, 
Well, yes. Uh, there's a lot of public stigmatism out there on your classic aggressive breeds, such as your Dobies, your, your Rottweilers, your uh, Bull Terrier type groupings. So they specifically look for dogs that are not threatening. And the most threatening thing about Molly here is that she's got a cooler beard than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they do see just as many, you know, golden retriever or lab mixes or even uh, uh, somebody just got a, a husky recently or husky mix. And uh, yesterday somebody has a German Shepherd. Uh, so we have a group of 16 folks going through two different campuses as we speak. Eddie. Uh, thank you for the talk. Oh, my pleasure. Really short questions. Uh, first, if people mistake her uh, on the street for a pet dog and they come to pet her, what would your reaction be? And the second question would be, we, we talk about uh, service animals, so are there any animals other than dogs that qualify as service I'm going to answer the second question because that one's easier. The Americans with Disabilities Act 1990 specifically stipulates there are only two types of animals that can be considered service animals, miniature horses and dogs. So that's the short answer. I haven't come across too many service horses or ponies, miniature ponies, to tell you the truth. Uh, I'd love to see one, you know, but that, that's just me. Every situation is handled differently. There's a professor of mine here in the classroom and other individuals, their classmates, you as my grad assistant for class, um, it really depends on a couple things. One, what is my current mood and situation? Is my dog acting up? Well, if my dog is acting up, it's because something's wrong with me. She feels everything I feel through the leash and vice versa. So it really depends. If you catch me in the hallway or I happen to be in your office for study hours, hint, hint, uh, I would love to introduce Molly to you if the, if the situation dictates. However, if you find me out in the middle of Walmart, say hi. And you know, I, I tend to say no at, at that point because if I let one individual, well now I've got all of Walmart. So it, it really depends on am I having a good day or am I having a bad day? Let's say uh, I'm having a good day in class and yeah, absolutely, come on up, meet Molly, we're cool. But that's not an open invitation and that's handler specific. So if I'm having a bad day and you run into me in Wegmans, I might not be okay with that. And I'll, I'll say, hey, right now is not a good time. We're working. Um, typically, that, that's enough. But there are some people out there that are just very adamant and don't understand that even if she's laying down, she's working for me. Hey, so. tell the Wegmans story you told me. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I haven't, I've been pretty lucky. Uh, I've had only a handful of incidents. Uh, the most prevalent uh, here on campus is many undergraduate and graduate students might miss their dog from home. And they see the vest, they clearly can read, do not pet, but they kind of forget about that. Um, it happens. So my big real desire that I'm working with campus on, uh, the campus on is to enforce a leash law. Because there are people that you know walk through campus, or their students are affiliated one way or another, that don't bother to leash their dog, and that can be a hazard to not only me and, and Molly, but other individuals such as yourselves. So that kind of rules the campus. But Wegmans, uh, it was this past Valentine's, and you know uh, I'm out shopping. I, I didn't have class that afternoon, so I'm in Wegmans and I'm at the deli counter ordering some pancetta to make a nice fancy Italian dinner for my girlfriend. And Molly's in a specific position where she's watching things behind me, so I have to worry about somebody sneaking up. And this older gentleman, uh, out loud, read, service animal, do not pet, and reached. What does Molly do? Molly gives me a little tap of, with her head onto the side of my knee, and I look over and now I'm putting one and one together. And I had to put my hand between him and you know, the gentleman in Molly and asked him, you know, please, we're working, please leave us, uh, leave us alone and give us some space. And that's typically enough for people to, to respect those boundaries, but this gentleman actually wanted to start a fist fight. <laughs> it happens. 
uh, some of the access issues that I've had, uh, sometimes uh, what I'll call internet certified service animals, we can all go on Amazon and within two days and five minutes from now, assuming there are no tech difficulties, you can have a service animal vest and an ID card in your hand. And those animals that are portrayed as service animals, I don't want to call them fake because they're actual dogs, right? But those individuals that are not properly trained go into a restaurant, maybe the dog sits on the table or does something horrific on the floor, you get my drift. Those individuals that are the restaurant proprietors or other entities might have a problem and give me a harder time. And that's okay because they're only allowed to ask me two questions by law. Is that a service animal and what does it do? So simply put, this is my service animal, Molly. She specifically assists me with mobility and medical alert by block brace cover and alert. And that is more than enough information. And anything more than that, well, they still want to say no. Well, one of the reasons why canines is the best is because they've got a 360 wraparound support. They do have a legal team that can answer general questions. They've got a sub great support staff that can call and explain, hey, um, McDonald, I'm not saying McDonald's specifically, but you know, hey, restaurant, um, are you aware of this? We had one of our graduate teams in your facility and you said no. Um, please update your policies and training accordingly. Thank you. And that's usually enough to, to get through, but if it's a more serious situation, they can connect you with a local re legal resource to get through that problem. And then on top of that, you've got 500 alumni that we are a very active alumni association, myself and a female medic. Uh, we kind of help keep tabs and run that group. So if anybody needs help 24 seven, there's always somebody that's A, can answer the phone and B, be able to help. To have this service dog. What is this road map? So okay. Uh, <clears throat> the other question is um, can you uh, tell a little bit more about the financing of all this stuff? Because oh, absolutely. Keeping dogs and training dogs and all, all, all these issues of quite a budget thing. So, who, who gives money for that? Exactly. Uh, I'll speak to the first one uh, briefly. Uh, I am not a subject matter expert on the Ukraine, uh, but that's something that we can talk about offline. Canines for Warriors and the Association of Service Animal Providers for Military Veterans have taken the Americans with Disabilities Act 1990 requirements, went with a higher training of standard, uh, tr standard of training called Assistance Dogs International, which the Ukraine might be a part of, and then they decided that's not enough. We need to be providing the best quality service animals to the best people we can. So they created a more stringent standard. So uh, that's how that kind of training happens and the level of training. Now the cost of training has come down. Uh, I'm hesitant to tell you exactly what Molly cost, but it's not just the cost of training. It's not just the cost of housing me for 21 days of training. It's also the meals on the economy because your basic training day is you wake up, you do basic obedience, you have lunch at a restaurant on the local economy and there are people that sponsor and give gift cards so this way everybody is equal uh, at the dinner table, if you will. And then there are volunteers that supply dinners at night. So there's a lot of access training and a lot of materials and a lot of research and that costs money. 
to sponsor a service animal as an individual. So if you wanted to open up your checkbook, sir, love to have it. It would cost $15,000 to sponsor a service animal. If we as this room wanted to say, you know what, we're gonna name a dog as the peer-to-peer -peer on you know, October 2nd, because we're a collective group, that's 20,000. Same thing for not only just church groups, but as well as corporate sponsors, and there are many. And along with that comes with, you, know, you get to name the dog. I found out that Molly was named because uh, a seven-year-old niece of her sponsor was like, you know what, that's Molly. And, and that's how that happened. So the cost has come down considerably, uh, but the $20,000 that I'm quoting here in the 15 doesn't come close to covering it. We're right around $30,000 now. And Molly was more expensive because you know the cost of production and limited means of production were, were different, if that makes sense. Does that kind of answer? Am I missing something? I got a brain injury, so short-term memory here. <laughs> oh, Jim. You mentioned a second ago, 21 days working with Molly. Yes. How, many, how long is the training prior to you being able to? It really all depends on the dog. Uh, Molly here was pretty quick. She was out of quarantine, entered training. 60 days later, she was on me. Uh, however, her kennel mate was in the kennel for down. Uh, her kennel mate was in the kennels for uh, several more months. Um, so it really depends on the dog. Molly just wanted to get up and work one day. <laughs> so. I was going to ask how you found out about K9 for Warriors and then the process that you've gone through of kind of realizing that since the relationship with K9 Warriors started for you, how your life has changed. Um, and the premise of that is uh, I've, I've dealt with a lot of people with, with injuries, um, people who are immobile, people who you know, need help walking, that type of deal. And, and for you, I mean, you have some of those issues, uh, but the unseen is sometimes hard for people to understand. So the narrative of yes. kind of how your life has changed since meeting. Invisible injuries are, are always weird. Uh, I, nine out of 10 times when people say, oh, service dog, you must be training it. Who are you training it for? I'm like, no, it, it, she's mine. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the dude that has accessibility issues. I, I don't like to say disability. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say accessibility, you know, uh, especially when it comes to like handicapped parking plates. Well, it's not, I get rockstar parking. No, it's an accessible parking to help me, especially to getting her in and out of the car. My story, uh, I, I apologize in advance. If you have tissues, break them out now. Um, I did my final out and I was on what's called terminal leave where I'm done serving, I'm just on final vacation, burning all those hours. And that was the second week of January, 2011. And I was on terminal leave until the end of March of the same year. And I had a hard time processing things. I was having some family issues. I was having, going from a sergeant somebody to a literally, you want fries with that kind of, kind of employment. And I didn't really know how to process all of this. And then my night hairs started. You know, in the EMS world, especially firefighters and police officers as well, they usually you know, turn off a light switch at the end of their duty day and they go home and nothing from the day really sticks with them. It's just when that light switch gets turned on unexpectedly, or in my case, it broke and it was just flashing nonstop like a strobe light. So the best way to handle my situation was to drive from Norfolk, Virginia to Dayton, Ohio, where my now ex-wife and children were, and she was staying behind to pack up the house because the military movers were gonna move everything back to Virginia for us. Say goodnight to my kids, crawl in a rain barrel, and squeeze off 145 caliber round to my face. And that was gonna be it. Uh, my best friend in the world, um, I keep throwing his name around because he, he really saved my life. And he is single-handedly uh, responsible for me going back to education. So he stopped my suicide attempt from actually happening. Got me the help I needed, and it was really no choice. Do you want to be handcuffed, or do you want to do this voluntarily? And well, not for anything, I don't like matching bracelets. <laughs> you know? So after I got out of my uh, voluntary stay after about a week and a half, um, I realized that I had a problem. And it's like somebody who's an alcoholic or a smoker. They know they need to quit. They know they need to stop this behavior, but they're not going to until it's their idea. 
Uh, we can all kind of sympathize with that I, that concept, right? So I struggled for years. I thought I had my, part of my illusion, I thought I had my shit together. It, I really didn't. And I had a medication interaction due to medications uh, that the VA was prescribing and nobody was talking to each other and I put myself in the hospital again. At that point, that's when my best friend said, you know, enough is enough. You're gonna come live with me and my wife and we're gonna get you right. And that meant uh, my buddy happened to be uh, working from home and part-time college student at the same time. And he took me three days a week to the VA hospital, three hours away. And yeah, he tried to make up, you know, his appointments to happen on the same day. So, you know, share some of the driving. But he wanted to make sure that I lived with him and I could get myself together. I ended up getting healthy, uh, took a job, met a great woman, uh, moved in together. That didn't work out. And I, I started slipping again. Uh, my best female friend in the world at the time, she was living up in Brooklyn and says, you know, when's the last time you've been home? When's the last time you've been in the city? Let's go get pizza. What are you doing this weekend? Before she could finish the sentence, I already had a bag packed and I was headed to the car. So I drove from Charlottesville, Virginia to Brooklyn, got there about midnight. We went over to the neighborhood corner bar, had a burger, had a beer. And, you know, the next day we just happened to walk around the city doing the dumb stuff that we did back in high school. You know, none of the, the traditional New York City tourist trap kind of stuff, the stuff that meant something to us in high school, you know, go to the old CBGBs and take the trains. And we ended up getting in contact with mutual friends from high school and said, you know what, let's go to the Bronx and let's go have dinner. So we were on the express train from Manhattan all the way up to the Bronx. And next thing I know, I'm throwing up on a subway platform and I don't remember much of what happened before other than getting on the train and getting off. Uh, what my friend did was uh, she grabbed me by the throat so I wouldn't pass out and kept me awake, kept me upright, and as soon as we got to the next stop on the cannonball, got me out, and then I kind of came to and I remember throwing up, and then I remember sitting on you know friends from high school's couch. So when I started getting myself together, they, they offered me a choice of basically any kind of beverage you can imagine, so I stuck with what I like, and that was coffee and a bourbon. <laughs> you know? And I had no idea, they were all sitting there playing with different technology, and they were searching for ways to help me. Uh, my friend Morgan, who, who got me through the subway incident, uh, we, we did some horseback riding growing up, and she knew when I was dating the woman previously that you know, she had horses, and I was doing great because I was at the barn every day. Whether I rode her, just went out there to go brush a horse and feed him. So she thought, you know, what about animal therapy? Uh, that, that's not a long-term solution. So they kept searching for service animals for veterans. And no matter how they searched for it, and over the next couple of days, however I searched for it, Canines for Warriors was always a top five hit. I applied to them. And it was a hassle trying to get a letter from the VA saying, you have post-traumatic stress disorder. Even though I've got the diagnosis here, no provider wanted to write that on, on letterhead. So that was a hassle with the application. The application is about 30 pages long, and it's for two reasons. One, it helps weed out people that just want a dog that can go anywhere they want. And two, it helps to really identify the needs of the veteran so they can pair the best dog in the kennel to the veteran. <clears throat> so we got through the application process, and I happened to be uh, going through vestibular therapy for balance, physical therapy for my shoulder and my back, and I knew I was going to have a really rough day with my psychiatrist. But I had an email you know, from now the chief operations officer saying, you know, hey, we got everything. We'll have a decision to you uh, by close of business today. So I do all the things that physiologically and emotionally really suck, right? Nobody wants to talk about these things. So how do I cope? I'm a, I'm a stress eater, if you can't tell. I'm working on that. I walked into the local grocery store that's kind of like Wegmans, and I was going to go get some you know, chocolate, and my phone gives that email alert, and I'm walking in with a little cart, and next thing I know, I'm crying my eyeballs out. Holy crap, somebody believed in me. And it was to the point that the whoever was running the front end of the grocery store, uh, that woman came over and grabbed me and was like, what's going on? So I explained to her real quick what was going on, showed her the email, she starts crying. It's like, you know, what are you here for? I'm like, I need something sugar. 
I don't know what I want, but I need sugar. (laughs) What do you like? And she tells me whatever kind of cupcake she likes, so I grab two. I go through the checkout line, and then I handed one to her as a, as a thank you, you know, and it was 15 months after that before I got Molly. And what got me through that 15 months was knowing that I've got Fido. I didn't know Molly's name. You don't know your dog's name until you get there. And then it's a surprise. Only the dog trainers know who you're getting. And there's a real big reveal in it. It's amazing. So knowing that I had Fido or Snoopy or Astro or Goofy, pick a dog name, right? Um, I knew somebody was there for me, and you know that was enough to get me through. And then when I got to canines, I found out that it was the best therapy I've ever had without a psychologist ever being around. You know, getting to sit there and shoot the proverbial with with my classmates, and really, you know, say, you know, I'm not alone. And a staff member who is a one of the house moms, she's there to make sure that we've got breakfast ready for us. You know, what do you want for breakfast? And, you know, continental make it yourself kind of deal. Uh, some of the general cleaning, even though we're responsible for mopping our rooms and making sure that we don't have, you know, dog hair everywhere because it piles up, trust me. But they had a great kitchen. And I asked the woman, you know, hey, is there any way that I can get over to Publix and get some stuff and do some cooking? You know, this is my, this is my stress relief. There are poets out there and there are artists out there. There are musicians. I cook while I, while I de-stress. He just grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me and said, listen, you jerk. It's time you let other people care about you. And I cried. So three times did I cry. I cried the day that I, I found out that I got accepted into a program and I never thought that I would be alive today. I cried when I met Molly. And I cried that day because Katharina said, you know what? Shut up and get over yourself. <laughs> People out there care about you. You got you to gotta allow that to happen. And that's when I finally started healing. And those were the first times that I cried for something that was not physiologic in I can't tell you how many years. Uh, Molly doesn't make everything go away. Service animals aren't the magic solution. What they are is a tool that you can use. And one of the ways that I use Molly as a tool is to in- encounter situations that I'd never dream of. Uh, One of the professors who's here has a class just downstairs with, how many were in that class? 200 and something? 150 in Maxwell Auditorium? Yeah, good luck getting me in there. If I wouldn't go in there without Molly, you think I'd ever went to my daughter's gymnastics meets or son's t-ball? Molly enables me to be a better father, an involved father. She allows me to be here to talk to you today. So, you know, the cool thing is I was on well over 20 medications a day, over 30 pills a day, and now I'm down to one antidepressant every day. Um, I've got stuff to do seasonal allergies and migraines that I take seasonally, so I don't really count them if we do. Well, that's three a day that I take in the spring, uh, in the spring and fall. You know, Tylenol, I'm not on narcotics anymore. I was on over 400 Percocets a day until I started getting my life together. So thank you guys so much for having me. Um, sorry if I made anybody need tissues with that. I, I deeply apologize. It, it's emotional for me as well as I know it can be for you. Anybody have any other questions? No? All right, well thank you guys for all coming. My lap, come on, uh-uh, my lap, my lap. Put girl. Yes.